who are joining us from all over the world. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here with you all. We have a powerhouse lineup of women speakers. So first thing is to make sure that you can hear them. Please go to the bottom of your screen and you should see a globe icon. That will allow you to choose the language that you would like to listen to today's program in. We are thrilled to say that we are offering simultaneous interpretation into six different languages, English, Spanish, Arabic, Khmer, Indonesian, Tamil, and Sinhala. So please find that globe icon, select your language, and click mute original audio. Um, a reminder that today's webinar is going to be recorded just for your information. Uh, I, would, I really wish we have so many amazing people here joining as well. I really wish we had time for everyone to introduce themselves. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat because um, it's so wonderful to have so many of you here. And please remember to mute yourself. Um, my name is Cassandra Waters. I'm the Senior Gender Specialist here at the Solidarity Center. Uh, I am so thrilled to be here with you all. We'll give it just one more minute so folks can get to get joined. Uh, for the 20 people who I see have joined just in the time that I've been talking, please remember. Good morning, sisters. Good morning, brothers. Good morning, siblings. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Shauna Bader Blau who is the executive director of the Solidarity Center, who is here to, to welcome us all and get us started. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Cassandra, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to my sisters and my brothers from all over the world who are joining us for this absolutely incredible, most awesome of anniversaries. The idea that we are two years since the adoption of Convention C-190 and the recommendation that has already been changing the lives of hundreds of thousands of workers around the world. The right to a workplace free from violence and harassment is totally important to building worker voice and power and creating and establishing true freedom and justice, economic, social, political, for all workers, for women workers, for LGBTQI workers, and for all workers in every part of the world. This webinar today really speaks to the idea that not only do we say workers cannot wait, we cannot wait to get more ratifications, we cannot wait to see C-190 nationalized into our national laws, we cannot wait, but it also speaks to how we will not wait and we have not been waiting. This convention is a product of 10 years, at least, of real good organizing, incredible movement building between the trade union movement led by its powerful and strategic women leaders who cannot wait for gender equality and who will not wait for an end to discrimination and violence that faces the LGBTQI plus community, cannot wait and won't wait. This convention is a product of 10 years of organizing also with our allies in the social justice movement, in the feminist movement, in all the countries in which we work. You know, this kind of discrimination and marginalization of workers is really that we see in all of our countries is at the root cause of gender-based violence and harassment. And this powerful convention with its incredibly inclusive language that defines the world of work fully, that defines the full dignity and humanity of all workers in all of our forms of work, informal, formal, agriculture, temporary, job seekers, this convention looks at the full worker in all of our humanity and says, we have a right to safety and we have a right to the freedom and dignity that comes with a good union contract, strong, safe, healthy workplace 
and the full realization of equality in the workplace. And, you know, worker solidarity amongst all of us across all of these continents, led by the LGBTQI plus worker uh, driven movement and the women's movement in the labor movement. We can make that change happen. So together we're gonna talk about how to do that today because workers cannot wait. And if there is one person who defines workers cannot wait and shows us what that means practically in terms of strategic vision, powerful, persistent organizing, incredible inspirational leadership at both the global level and at the grassroots level of this movement, if there is someone out there that defines this, it's my sister, Chidi King, the director of the Equality Department at the ITUC and soon to be our sister leading this movement over at the ILO. And so I wanna turn it over to my powerful sister and comrade, Chidi King, who will lead uh, the rest of the session. Thank you, sisters and brothers, for being here. Thank you for being in this movement. Thank you. Hand it over to Chidi. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, and uh, thank you for your kind words. It's always such a pleasure to listen to you. You never fail to inspire and to energize. Um, so thank you so much um, for that and for your lovely words um, of introduction. Um, wow, we have well over 100 participants um, joining us today, which speaks to just how important an event this is. I can really scarcely believe it. We're, we are on the threshold of um, C-190 coming into force. And as Shauna said, you know, after more than 10 years of union campaigning, organizing, movement building, we now have the instruments that can help us really fight and eliminate gender-based violence and harassment from our world of work. As Shauna said, we are done waiting. You know, as workers, as women, as women in all our multidimensional um, identities and I diversity, we are done waiting. It's time now to act. I'm not going to spend too much time um, on introductions here because, like you, I can't wait to hear from the amazing sisters um, that the Solidarity Center has lined up for us, all of whom have been so deeply involved in making a world of work free from of violence and harassment a reality. Um, for workers um, all over the world. And these women are still today fighting to ensure that that reality becomes embedded in everything that we do as trade unions, as um, the women's movement, as feminist movements, and as human rights um, movements. Um, these instrument, instruments, I'm sure you know already, are quite revolutionary. I don't think we've seen anything like them before come out of um, the ILO. Um, they marry, I think the ILO itself would say, the human rights world with the very strong occupational health and safety world with the non-discrimination and inequality world, brings all of those elements together in a really truly intersectional perspective, recognizing that you know, with so many, um, or, or with such a strong link between violence and harassment and inequality and discrimination, um, that really paying attention to addressing inequalities to addressing um, diversity. And by this, I don't mean casually diversity. I mean, really recognizing the fact that so many of us have multiple identities that interact to expose us to discrimination, to inequality, to violence and harassment. If we don't tackle all of these together as a package, then we're only tackling part of the problem and not the whole of the problem. So I think um, without further ado, I'm going to um, start introducing um, well, first of all, the co-sponsors, thank you, <laughs> Cassandra, I did not have this. I'm really pleased to introduce the event co-sponsors, which show exactly how much of a movement building, um, you know, approach has been taken to the work around um, eliminating gender-based violence and harassment. So congratulations and thank you to the Solidarity Center, of course, um, to AWID, the Association for Women's Rights in um, Development, to Gender at Work, to the International Domestic Workers um, Federation, pleased to see many of the members here with us today, to the International Lawyers Assisting work, Workers Network, um, to the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, to the International Transport Workers Federation, to Just Associates, JAS, um, and to Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, um, WIGO. 
So again, it just shows you um, so much of that movement building and coalition building. So again, congratulations to you all um, for this event. Um, let me move swiftly then to introducing um, our wonderful uh, lineup of speakers to remind you that we have a chat box available, so don't hesitate to post questions um, in the chat. I see hands going up um, already um, before we start. Um, I don't know, Cass, if you want to see if that's a technical issue um, that we need to address before we launch into, into the program proper or whether we are good to go. I think there's a hand up from Mona Lisa. Um, just there. Um, yes, um, Mona Lisa, are you having technical issues? We're asking folks to please save uh, questions for the panel to the end. But if you have a technical issue, uh, I'm going to unmute you briefly so you can share with us. Or uh, please feel free to also use the chat. Okay, so while um, we're figuring that out, I will start introducing um, the speakers. Um, it's going to be a very interactive panel. I'm so happy to have these, um, these speakers with us today. Um, just a reminder, polite reminder to our speakers that you'll have five uh, minutes each for your interventions. We're going to take two rounds of interventions and then um, we're going to move on to um, questions and answers. So again, encouraging you to post your questions and answers. Um, you know, your questions rather in the chat and we'll um, get the panelists um, to answer them as best you can. We'll be quite strict on the on the timekeeping. Cassandra is going to help me out just to make sure that we can hear indeed from, from all of you and get time to interact um, with participants. Um, so with us today, we have, um, and I'll do a brief um, run through of all of the speakers before asking the questions. We have um, Salamatu Aliou from um, the Nigeria Labour Congress. Um, Salamatu, lovely to have you here. Um, Salamatu is a Vice President and National Women um, Commission Chair at the NLC. And it, please forgive me if I mispronounce anybody's name. Um, should probably have practiced this beforehand. Uh, we have um, Nelly Dina Kawa, who's the General Secretary of the Namibian Domestic and Allied Workers Union. We have Isela Juarez, um, who's the President of the Union of Municipal Service Workers in Honduras. We have Turia, who I've known for a very long time, so lovely to see you again, um, uh, Turia Tialahesh, who's now the coordinator for Coalition C190 for a world of work um, free from violence and harassment. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go turn first to, um, to Nelly and ask, um, Nelly, you, you as um, the General Secretary of the Namibia Domestic and Allied Workers Union have been campaigning with your union. Um, with domestic workers, with workers across Namibia um, for the ratification um, of C-190. And Namibia has indeed become one of only two um, African countries so far um, to ratify C-190 and is amongst the first six countries um, to ratify. Um, it would be great if you could share with us the two key strategies that unions um, employed to make sure um, that um, the Namibian government um, ratified C-190. Over to you. Please do unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the question and thank you for giving us the opportunity to join the program. It is very important in explanation and expressing us our view. Uh, in, in terms of our strategy, normally we used to use media, social media. It, uh, it was our key, uh, key strategy where we have to go through the national radio, we have to uh, mobilize um, all the workers at least to be aware of I think we were I was trying to figure out whether it was my connection, but I think we may just have lost um, Nelly momentarily. So um, give it a second to see if um, she can reconnect. And if not, we will move to the next speaker and then come back to um, Nelly when she's able 
to join us. Yeah, that's a shame. I think we, we may have lost her for now, but hopefully she'll be able to um, reconnect with us. I'll move on then to Isela Juarez, um, who's the president of the Union of Munip Municipal Service Workers, Citrasemka, in Honduras. And um, Isela, um, you and organizers um, in your union really have been um, targeted um, in some ways quite extremely um, with gender harassment, threats, violence, as a result of your organizing and um, the leadership um, within your union. Um, there is certainly a strong link between um, anti-union violence and gender-based violence and harassment. Um, could you discuss the gendered impacts of those, of those links um, with us and how your union um, has been using um, perhaps C-190 as a tool to, um, to address um, those linkages? Hola, sí, buenos días, muchas gracias. Eh, efectivamente, algunos Good morning. Yes, some of the some of our executive board members here at Citra uh, here in Honduras have been harassed by members of the of city town in our workplace. This has caused several psychological problems in some of our workers. And because of that, many uh, municipal workers have had to leave the country actually looking for better opportunities. We have reported these cases to uh, the network of violence, uh, anti-union violence, our organization that in 2015 we created with the help of the Solidarity Center. We did this because we saw impunity in the way that the authorities were handling violence against union members and because they were doing nothing to protect union members and some activists that were risking a lot to actually defend the rights of their fellow colleagues. I confess that in my own experience, it's really hard to be the target of threats and harassment. The victim is not just us as union leaders, the victim is also our families. It goes against the stability of the union because every single one of our members feels intimidated and sometimes they feel like uh, giving up their job because the, the environment is toxic because it's full of harassment and full of violence. In 2018, I was going towards uh, my job and two men in a motorbike, two men I had never seen before, but they were wearing balaclavas. They started chasing me. I was in a taxi. And every time they got closer to my cab, they started pointing a gun to me as if they were trying to, to take fire to aim and take fire. I immediately called the network of protection and since i didn't get an immediate response i decided to call several colleagues from the network against anti-union violence and it was them actually who called the uh, the work um the work aggregate at the american embassy and he was the one who interceded in my favor before the, the authorities, so I would be protected in my work environment and also that protection would include my family. Why am I mentioning this? Because this has affected me personally, but it affects my colleagues, the people that work with me in the union. We are living in a very small region. Everybody knows each other. And this is something uh, that affects us all. If one of us is threatened, everybody is threatened. and. This, hap this is happening because we're trying to defend our labor rights. I also would like to mention the fact that if you're a female union leader, you're more affected than if you're a male union leader. We have, uh, we have five male leaders and myself in the union in my region. And we have seen how there's a disproportionate incidents in my case. In my case, I received twice the threats as men. And obviously we don't want men to be harassed or at risk either. But when we analyze what is going on, 
we realize that if you're a female union leader, you are more at risk just for the just because you're a woman. Employers also, regardless of whether they are in the public or private sector, they use violence to intimidate union leaders, and they also use it um, against women because they have a multiplying effect against the, uh, the collectivity. Because if they harass women, they this multiplies the humiliation and the stigmatization messages, and they do it so that the fear extends and no women dares to speak. In the network against anti-union violence, we have been able to uh, to talk about our experiences, and we have been able to put together some uh, brainstorming about how this is happening and how it affects differently women and men. Generally speaking, we could say that there's definitely a pattern, and in some occasions, when the, the direct victims are women. The threats are carried out through mothers, through children, trying to intimidate us further because, of course, we have a very st uh, strong relationship between uh, mother and child or with our own mothers. And this is what the uh, the perpetrators use against us. We, use, we see this very, very often in the region. We see this in we see the situation happening again and again, family women that are also active in the labor movement. They try to intimidate us through our mothers and through our children. In general, the uh, attacks against women happens in the, uh, the private environment through calls, through emails. And when they take place in public, they always try to appeal to our sexuality, uh, saying misogynist comments or sexist comments. And more often than not, it's men actually who are behind this aggression. We are concerned that despite the advance that we've seen in the uh, in legislation in our country, violence against women is still recognized as something that it belongs to the to the family environment. It's something that is dealt with in private, and they uh, they often paint this as uh, being women as just a vessel for reproduction as Sita Semka and as a part of the union movement and in the network against anti-union violence, we have been asking the Honduran government comprehensive measures to put a stop to this, that, uh, that guarantee the access of women to resources against violence. We have also asked them to, to use resources to empower women economically and create public policy that can improve the social protection of vulnerable groups. We have been fighting for this from the very first moment since we created our, our union. And we have been dealing with uh, anti-union violence and gender violence everywhere. And we've been step by step building measures to improve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isela. Um, and, and thank you actually for keeping to time so much um, rich um, information that you just shared with us in that, in that five minutes. Um, how to unpack it all. I mean, you illustrated so succinctly and clearly how gender-based violence and harassment is an issue of power. It's an issue of power relationships. It's an issue of control. It's an issue of subjugation. It's not an individual issue. It's a collective issue. It's a societal issue. And we need to address it and approach it um, as such. So thank you so much um, for sharing um, uh, the horrific incident that you yourself um, personally um, went through. We're grateful. Um, I'll just um, remind um, our speakers, myself included, um, that we have interpretations, so um, let's not go too fast, um, just to help out um, our interpreters. Um, and I see that Nelly is back with us, so um, Nelly, I hope that um, your um, connection will stay solid um, this time around, and I'll just come straight back to you. Um, Without further ado, so Nelly, if you're there and you can join, please okay. thank, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much once again. And my apology, uh, this is what we are going through. So I talk about uh, we we use uh, social media, which is where we use most of the national radio station and um, television, where we have to go and lobby the government and all the things. So at least the most, the, most, the, the most important things for us was the demonstration that we did. Demonstration started with a machine campaign through the street of 
all the regions because we, Namibia is having 14 regions and we targeted eight regions out of the 14 regions. We host more than four or five uh, campaigns uh, through the streets. So at least we can be able to, to lobby the nation, the, the community, the domestic workers themselves, and then the other sisters union as well, because what we did, we did not do it in terms of domestic workers only to for them to, to stop the harassment at workplace. We wanted to, for the whole entire workers uh, through all the, the, the regions to be covered. So uh, therefore we, we, we use um, handing over of petitions through the offices of the, the governor and the town councillors, uh, domestic workers, they read the petition, they hand over to Minister of Labor. They done such kind of beautiful demonstration with posters, reflets, banners, where we provided uh, indicate uh, messages uh, to the nation to see what do we want? We want to stop uh, the harassment at workplace. Um, in terms of, of, of the different towns uh, where Dawu leaders met uh, town councillors to sensitize the importance of the ratification of 190, but also lobby, the, lobby them to influence the government because this is the only strategy that we can use is through the town councillors' offices because they are the one who can influence and motivate the, 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 the politicians to, to provide this petition, uh, hand it over to the to the parliament so that at least the ratification can take place. Um, but more than 250 to 300 domestic workers participated in this event. Uh, this is the most the most important part for us because we, we never participated only on our own. We also include sisters union, we include the, the, the public outside there to join us and to lobby together uh, in terms of, of, of what, what is our needs of what is the needs of the domestic workers. Uh, the domestic workers were demonstrating with posters, flyers, reflets, we have mobs, we have banners, we have buckets, we have brooms, at least for them, to, for us to show them that this is our work and we are very proud to fight for the rights in the, for the rights of the domestic workers and the other parties outside there. Uh, the second strategy that we use, uh, I might say uh, Namibian domestic workers was very lucky uh, as an organization to be nominated by the National Federation uh, to serve on the Labor Advisory Council Board as a, a Board of Council Committee. So on that tripartite body is where we use our power as domestic workers. Me, myself sitting there, uh, since 2017 up to date, I think I'm going to 2023. So we are, we are still having that opportunity to still force the government uh, to force the implementation. So um, in, on that platform is where I use the power of domestic workers, that the information that I get from domestic workers outside and from the other sisters union and then from the federation so at least to lobby the stakeholders in terms of the employers' federations, the, 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 the state itself, to say, okay, fine, this is what we need, this is what's supposed to be done. We need to, done to do some get anal analysis so that at least the ratification can take place. And I think it's with, with that power where I sit on the Labor Advisory Council, where we have the opportunity to, to submit the recommendation to Minister of, 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 of Labor, so that at least the recommendation was submitted to the parliament where the ratification took place in 2020, last year in December. I think so far, this is the only strategy that we were using. So I'm still waiting for more questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nelly. Wow, what powerful action and activity you had going on there. Um, there was so much that, you, you know, I'm still trying to absorb it all. The petitions, the work with the media, the alliance building, um, you know, the dialogue with the government, all of it. Um, and of course, um, the domestic workers movement did play a very key role in the development um, of this new convention. And this year, we're not just celebrating C-190 coming into force, we're also celebrating the 10th anniversary of Convention 189, um, which brought um, you know, decent work to domestic workers, recognizing that the work you do is so important. And I think these two instruments combined can change the working lives um, and the lives overall of domestic workers um, to 
such an extent that we really do have to continue um, with our efforts to make them a lived reality rather than just exist on paper. So again, thank you to you um, for all that you do. Just going to move on to our next um, speaker, and I hope that the audience is thinking of questions and comments um, for our speakers. Um, next up, we have Turia. Um, Turia, such a joy to see you again. And a reminder that Turia is coordinating um, the coalition um, C190 for a world of work free from violence and harassment in Morocco. So Turia, could you tell us a little bit more about that coalition um, uh, in Morocco, um, which the labor movement has built up to support ratification of C190? Who are the members and why, building, why was building this coalition such a key strategy? Um, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Shili. This is uh, always a great opportunity to get together and to see a number of faces uh, with whom we have worked for years in order to get to the ratification of 190. And here we are two years on after having adopted it at the ILO level. And uh, this means that we are still here and that we are still at it and that we are on the right direction for achieving more. Now, for us, uh, from the Moroccan perspective, I'm uh, Thuraya Laharaj. I'm a trade unionist and a representative of the NGO Fabric in Morocco. I'll talk to you a little bit about the Coalition 190, which has uh, sourced its name from the Convention 190 for a world of work that is free from violence and harassment. You will all remember that when we were in Geneva and we were right in the middle of the jubilation after the adoption of the convention, there was one question that we were all asking. So what next? What will happen now? And so we've been thinking and we <laughs> brought <laughs> different minds uh, together. And, uh, we have uh, discussed the importance of making this convention a societal affair. Obviously, the uh, leaders in this uh, line of work are the women of the various unions. And as you know, in uh, Morocco, there's a uh, number of uh, women leaders in unions with a high level of uh, action and strategy. But we did not want for the conversation to be limited to the union sphere. And so we organized a meeting at the level of the House of Councillors, which is the upper house of parliament in Morocco. And during that meeting, all the representatives of civil society, unions, of course, but also uh, human rights organizations, uh, women's organizations, feminist uh, groups, uh, parliamentarians, uh, advisors, everybody was there. And uh, with us, there was also a representation of uh, the UN, which is the UN Women's Office in Rabat, the capital of Morocco. We presented the convention, we explained it, and we said that this convention is not just a convention that pertains to the work of unions. It has to do with society at large. And uh, as such, we have to put our hands together. And uh, everybody uh, approved of uh, the idea. And we have issued a declaration. It was the 19th December 2019. And the declaration announced the creation of Coalition 190 for a world of work free of violence and harassment. And we set up a work plan. And basically, we started by defining those who will have a right to be part of the coalition, knowing that we will leave the door open for everybody. But we wanted to set some uh, firewalls. We wanted people who believe in human rights, in the rights of women as they are understood internationally, and parties and stakeholders who are ready to activate their efforts against all forms of discrimination and for the rights of women and their dignity. After that, we worked on a memorandum. I'm showing it to you here. If you can see it, the title is in Arabic, and you can see the logo of our Coalition 190. And this memo, we've uh, developed it for a particular purpose. We wanted to say that there is no pretext. There's 
no pretext for the Moroccan government to not ratify this convention anymore. We organized a press conference afterwards, and during that press conference, we presented this memo to the community of journalists, and there's been uh, interviews with... Uh, within the coalition uh, from unions and otherwise. And let me tell you that uh, the CDT and the UMT, two large unions in Morocco have been there with their heavy weights and uh, continue to be the pillars of this coalition. Now, after that, we have uh, set up a, an advocacy plan as part of this uh, plan, we have started by holding a meeting with the labor minister because during the various events that we organized, we wanted to raise awareness and also to uh, mainstream the spirit of the convention. We worked with the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Labor, with the Ministry of uh, Human Rights. And we, among the things that we have uh, seen when we would uh, pick up the phone and uh, want one stakeholder or the other to uh, intervene and we would uh, present ourselves and say we are coalition 190 and we want to put pressure on the moroccan government to ratify c190 the answer would be well we don't know about this convention what is this convention and so we had the national human rights council to look into the convention and to adopt it and to support us in it also the uh, national social environmental and economic council was present with us in one of the events and looks into the convention and brought us on board to talk about the convention and the memo that we developed. And also the uh, audiovisual regulator in Morocco because the media has a great role to play when it comes to uh, eliminating violence and educating the people, uh, human rights-based education and uh, other ministries, etc. So anyway, we kept at it and we held a meeting at the level of the head of government's office. We presented our memo once again and we held a uh, working session with the Ministry of Labor and we presented it with the highlights of the convention and the various considerations and uh, arguments on which we base our approach for ratification. And after that, we held a working session with the Minister of Solidarity and Women and we did the same. In addition to all of this, we have done some other work at the level of the unions, uh, particularly those who are represented at the House of Councillors level. And Wonderful we would always to, take yeah. the floor to say that there's this convention and that Morocco has to ratify it. Why? Excellent. Because there is no I'm reason whatsoever to for Morocco us, um, not to sorry, ratify to it. Interrupting. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I'm can going you, to ask you to tell us a little bit more about what you have been doing um, with the government and the push for ratification in the next session, because we've just about um, ran out of time. I don't like cutting people off, but I'm keen um, that we have uh, we make the most of our time together and you're sharing such vital information with us, showing us that, you know, what a careful and strategic process coalition building is. And this is exactly what you've done in the C-190. Um, a coalition um, in Morocco. And the, the whole aspect of awareness raising and education, um, you know, is, is vital around these issues if we're going to push for ratification. You're demonstrating clear, clearly that, you know, women in Morocco are done waiting. They're not going to wait. They're pushing for this now. So thank you so much for that. We're just going to move on to um, the final speaker of this round. Very excited to introduce Salamatu, who's a Vice President and National Women Commission Chair at the Nigerian Labour Congress, NLC. Um, I know that the NLC has been um, campaigning extremely actively um, to end gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work for the ratification of C-190. Um, so Salamatu, can you tell us um, what have um, the what has the NLC, along with women activists, um, done um, that has been most effective in pushing towards ratification? As I say, I know you've been engaged in so many things. So perhaps you could just pick out um, two or three to really highlight for us that have been particularly effective. Um, over to you, Salamatu. Thank you very much for this privilege to share some of the work we've done to towards the ratification of C-190 in Nigeria. At the beginning of it all, 
we held a meeting and took a decision that we should have statistics to show that gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work actually exist in Nigeria because our leaders, the government, cutting across employers and some of our uh, union leaders do not believe that gender-based violence and harassment actually exists in the world of work in Nigeria. So we wanted to prove that gender-based violence and harassment exists in our workplaces in Nigeria. And we took a decision that we want to do it ourselves because it is a way of telling our story ourselves. We didn't want a, a third party to do it for us. So we went through training and took up the challenge. And at the end of the day, we now have a tool which no employer of labor, no stakeholder can dispute the fact that gender-based violence and harassment is in existence in our world of work in Nigeria. And doing it ourselves gave us the opportunity to actually know those gender-based violence that takes place in different sectors of our economy, be it private or not public. Sectors which did not believe before, now believe because of the research we have done. We now have a tool that we use in campaigning authoritatively for the ratification of ILOC 190. Information gathered help us to continue with media advocacy and on the spot demand for ratification of ILOC 190. And that has brought about the activation of the National Labor Advisory Council that has not been active for the past seven years. The government was now forced to activate it and inaugurated it in March, 2021. And in, at the inaugural meeting, Labor made it clear that the ratification of ILOC 190 is the way to go. And it was accepted. This council is a tripartite council that advises the government that this particular ILO convention should be ratified. So very soon we are expecting that C-190 will be ratified in Nigeria since the council is now functional. The second action is a coalition building with CSOs, the media, business women in Nigeria, then the uh, uh, people living with disability. This action has brought diverse views across different contexts, speaking out against gender-based violence and harassment in the place of work. We brought in the wider civil society as they were not very knowledgeable about ILOC 190. They thought it was meant only for the organized labor. Due to the fact that most of them had fought for violence against people's prohibition act 2015, they felt that was enough for them. But we were able to bring them to get involved in the research from the training to execution. And now they are convinced that we need to work together. It's not a labor thing. We are currently expanding our coalition to the Nigerian women in business and our brothers and sisters who are living with disability because they are part and parcel of those who suffer gender-based violence in their places of work. So these two activities, the research and the coalition building are tools that has helped us to push for ratification of C-190 up to date. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Salamatu. Very clear. And again, you um, have just underlined this, as um, all the other speakers have, I seen that the crucial importance of building 
these broad coalitions um, and alliances and you're describing there not only within our movement but also you know with politicians um, you know with the media and with the business or crucial partners um, in all of this um, you know employers need to take up the responsibility um, for um, eliminating um, gender-based violence and harassment from our world of work, um, but also those alliances with workers in the informal economy. Um, thank you for highlighting, um, you know, reaching out to um, disabled workers or workers with disabilities. We know that, um, you know, um, in terms of um, violence and harassment, it usually is um, the so-called, I think what the convention describes as vulnerable groups, but um, what we would say are workers who face, um, you know, increased exposure to inequality and discrimination who can be um, particularly severely um, impacted um, by violence and harassment. So thank you for highlighting all of that, you know, workers with HIV AIDS, migrant workers, racialized workers, indigenous workers, young workers, etc. These are all workers, um, LGBTQI plus workers, as Shona mentioned in her introduction, you know, these are all workers that we need to ensure are part of this movement to end gender-based um, violence and harassment in the world of work. So thank you again um, for describing that and also for highlighting the importance of um, evidence you know you think that by now we have so much um, evidence of the prevalence of gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work but it's true that we are repeatedly called on to, to to you know justify what we're talking about so that um information gathering evidence gathering is of crucial um importance still so thank you again for that um, we are now moving on to um the second round of of interventions and i'm going to come back to um, to Turia, and because you know I, I had to abruptly uh, cut you off, Turia. So here's a chance to continue telling us a little bit more about the important information that you were going to share um, with us. Um, you know, you told us about the importance of um, coalition building, um, but can you share some of the challenges that you've anticipated um, along the way as you continue um, advocating for ratification of C190? Um, by the Moroccan government. And yes, please do share with us again some of the activities um, that you have been undertaken um, in, in, within this coalition to push for ratification. Thank you very much, uh, dear Shidi. When uh, we were working on this uh, topic, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, that uh, in our coalition uh, we had uh, uh, for example the federation representing moroccan uh, uh, living abroad and also the migrants workers and also we had associations representing people with disabilities we organized a very important event to which we invited the, the um, uh, union of uh, employers and uh, moroccan uh, companies and uh, we were following up with the ministry of labor to see where our memorandum uh, and uh, where the, dis uh, the point of discussions have uh, reached. So we know that uh, we had uh, with the Ministry of Labor in uh, Geneva at the ILO uh, a certain, let's say, uh, a discussion concerning the uh, reservation that uh, the uh, um, Moroccan government uh, made relating to some gender uh, aspects. And uh, we've been uh, following up with the Ministry of Labor as there was a committee that was set uh, within the Ministry of Labor to discuss uh, our um, memorandum with, our, with different experts. And uh, we're still waiting for their response. We have also supporters uh, within the Ministry of Labor, so we try to find um, allies in all the ministries. And today, we uh, can see the glimpses of uh, Moroccan government ratifying this uh, convention. We also uh, developed uh, some uh, videos to explain uh, the reason for this uh, coalition. There is also a guy that explains uh, the convention and simplifies it for uh, the workers. 
And uh, we also noticed uh, that the trade unions uh, considered this uh, convention as a women's uh, convention. And uh, because when they heard uh, about the violence and in violence and uh, harassment, they thought that it was directed only and merely towards uh, women, while the convention in, uh, encourages the social di dialogue and also to include the violence in the uh, social discussions and debates and violence is not targeting women only, but everyone can be exposed to violence uh, either on their way uh, back or forth uh, from uh, work or at the workplace. And from uh, the uh, very positive uh, outcomes of this um, uh, coalition is that women within uh, political parties uh, asked us to organize meetings to involve uh, women uh, politician uh, leaders in order to uh, embark on our efforts to ratify this uh, convention or have it ratified by the Moroccan government. To Morocco is now uh, preparing for the uh, upcoming elections. And I think that this is the right time to uh, make uh, more efforts in order to have this uh, convention ratified. When we build coalitions, and when everybody is uh, gathering around one demand and request, I think that we can have positive uh, results. And uh, this is why we open up to work also with uh, our comrades in the um, uh, Arab uh, region. There was some exchanges uh, um, with uh, the uh, Arab um, uh, Department of the CSI with also uh, Shidi, uh, Shona and uh, Erin and Robin. So uh, we've been working together. We've been learning from our comrades' uh, experiences and uh, we uh, see that uh, there are more countries uh, ratifying this uh, convention and this brings much hope that we will be maybe the next uh, uh, country. So we won't wait and we won't stop working and uh, we won't stop making efforts and uh, fighting to make this uh, uh, convention uh, ratified. And thank you, Shidi, for giving me back the floor. Thank you, Turiya, um, for sharing that. It's clear that um, the government of Morocco cannot ignore um, your efforts. Um, so wish you the best of success um, with your continued efforts um, for the ratification of C-190. And I love some of the strategies that you've described, including using you know, the fact that you've built all this awareness um, through um, your coalition um, building um, activities. Um, and it can become, you know, a campaign, campaigning strategy with elections um, coming up, you know, making it a key issue that plays into those elections. So wishing you all the success um, with that. Um, thanks very much again. Um, coming back now to um, Salamatu. Um, Salamatu, um, what, having just heard um, what Turiya has shared in terms of their next steps. What do you see as critical next steps um, in the NLC's efforts to um, get C-190 ratified and implemented? Thank you, Chidi, once again. Training and retraining of different cadre of union leaders and workers at union level, including the shop floor members, on gender-based violence and harassment and the C-190 language is a critical next level for NLC. Mm -hmm. This will help them understand and disseminate information on gender-based violence and harassment and C-190 properly. Because mm -hmm. as leaders, as workers, we should be able to tell what these things mean, to walk them, talk them, educate others. Some people do not know what uh, C-190 has for them. So they are not keen about its ratification. So education is a necessity. So we have to face educating our members properly. Therefore, we want our affiliates to understand the language of C-190 
and how valuable C190 will be to everybody, no matter the, the sex, when it is ratified. So it has to be a war for everybody to fight because it's a win-win situation. We are all, all going to be beneficiaries of this. There's a critical next level, which we are not waiting until uh, C-190 is ratified in Nigeria. And that mm -hmm. is unions stepping down to the workplaces, C-190 language, putting them into their constitution and uh, bylaws. This we have started. Right now we are doing that with the textile union. Because in our research, we discovered that there are some, some sectors that we should not delay before we go in there. Unfortunately, the textile uh, union is one of them. So we have, we have trained their leaders. We have trained people that we step down for us there. We have even gone to the factory, a particular factory that was found. The research was carried out in and was found to be a corporate in this uh, gender-based violence and harassment. Fortunately, the leaders of the company are ready to cooperate with us. So we've gone into train and retrain. And three members have been, a three member committee has been putting up, has already been putting up by the union to look at their constitution and bylaws to see where they can step in this uh, language of uh, C-190. The third thing we are going to engage in vigorously is to continue vigorous sensitization of women in the informal sector using indigenous languages, jingle, and messages to break the culture of silence and stigmatization of gender-based violence and harassment and make more women speak out about their experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Salamatu. That was um, fascinating, again, to see um, the amount of work that's going on and, and very targeted approach that you have as well to making um, C190 and R206 um, real for um, all workers and where, wherever they happen to be. And as you said, um, and um, Turiya, before you said, this is everybody's business. You know, um, women, of course, in all our diversity are most impacted by um, violence and harassment through gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. But, um, you know, everybody is affected, including men, by gender-based violence and harassment, um, you know, um, in the world of work. So great to hear you um, sharing some of the work you're doing um, around that and how you're targeting some sectors, some union, um, sectoral unions as well, particularly initially, um, which is something that's also taken up by the convention itself, recognizing that some sectors um, are more exposed to experiences of violence and harassment. Um, than others, even if it occurs in every single sector um, that we can think about. Love the work you're doing around your union constitution and bylaws and to really embed um, the language um, of C-190 and its recommendation um, in, within um, your affiliates um, and the training, the training, the training and education um, that's going on. Thank you so much for sharing um, those strategies um, with us. Um, coming back to Isela now, um, Isela, in your first um, uh, contribution, you shared with us um, exactly how anti-union violence and gender-based violence and harassment often go hand in hand. And you did share with us again um, that horrific personal, um, a frightening experience um, that you um, personally went through. Um, could you tell us now just how your union has been using C-190 as an advocacy tool to organize workers and to demand fair treatment um, from employers? Gracias, Chidi. Bueno, si bien eh, el convenio está aprobado. Thank you, Chidi. Yes, the, conven the convention has been approved and I want to uh, thanks uh, on part of behalf of all of the people who worked against uh, the violence. This recognition for all women, laborists and feminists and for all of the effort that they have done over years and months and now is the fruit of the uh, 
labor movement the, and getting rid of gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. And as many of you have worked, have mentioned, gender-based violence is one of the most human, uh, frequent uh, threats of human rights. And it influences the, the equality and equity of gender uh, and it affects women and men in all sectors and in all many occasions. And it includes psychological, physical, and emotional damage. And from the moment that the labor movement have been working against violence, uh, gender-based violence, there has been the attention of many labor organizations, feminist organizations, and human rights organizations. The the High Commission here in Honduras and many public entities. And they have joined the forces to make uh, the ratification of the con convention uh, possible. And also has been the important work of federations that have been working on uh, critical reflection about the 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 uh, reg the bylaws that exist as just as our previous uh, sister just mentioned this has helped us to work with the internal operations and if the if the conven conven convention has been ratified in Honduras there's they're still not using the elements of it and so we are trying to have organizations that are more democratic and that are more just for women and members of the community, of the LGBTQI community, and also those who are more vulnerable. But these processes don't come out of nowhere. Over many years, the Solidarity Center has been promoting uh, legal promoters, uh, legal um, support in order to work on the defense of labor and, human, and gender rights. And these companions have been training leaders on the, on the issues of, of violence based in gender in the world of work. And these men are talking about the importance of examining their masculinities and to have joint objectives that will achieve an equity of gender, not just for us, but for everyone. We need spaces for reflection where the labor unions and in the network can uh, can work together. We've had campaigns to talk about the, the violence for people who are most vulnerable. And we've been using the perspective of sensitizing and, con and raising consciousness to be able to be to stop gender and, and um, gender based violence and harassment. We've worked in four different regions of the Honduran uh, co country. We've been doing training with organizations that need it. We've been giving press conferences and we've been having public forums in order to let the population know that workers ex have this tool that can benefit them for everyone. And we have to have the, the capacity to articulate all of these aspects so that this ratification about uh, the prevention of violence based on gender is something that can be not just in our country where we've done the work of collecting signatures, working with domestic workers and so many different people who have signed on and, and carried this to the executive and legislative branches so that they can ratify the, con the convention. And we've been having constant rounds of meetings in all of the regions so that this convention would be known not just by workers, but by their employers. The government of Honduras has the challenge to ratify this convention. And up to now, they have denied this, uh, this um, action. They haven't adopted the internal norms and they haven't demonstrated the, the will of the state to create a, a, a world of work that is decent, that, that benefits uh, the entire Honduran population. 
So this is why the, the labor movement in Honduras has been working to constantly push for the ratification of the Convention 190. But up to this date, unfortunately, the Honduran government has, has denied the ratification. We have to continue in a constant struggle and pushing, pushing the state, the government, and all of the bodies that are able to be constantly involved in asking that all to be joining in this movement. And one thing that is favorable for Honduras is that the organizations of human rights and the feminist organizations and groups of young people, all of these groups have been coming together to make it a much stronger fight, a, a fight with resistance for the ratification of, of Convention uh, 190. Thank you. Again, thank you so much, um, Isela. And, um, you know, uh, I'm in awe of the work that is going on um, all over the world um, that all our speakers um, have shared with us um, already today. Um, and, you know, that theme keeps coming through about the importance of building those alliances, of, of um, working across so many um, groups, organizations, um, to ensure that nobody is left out, that, you know, everybody um, is protected um, against violence and harassment, um, in particular, uh, particularly gender-based violence and harassment, as you mentioned, um, in all of this work, important to, to make the spaces for reflections, to challenge masculinities that can be so toxic, um, both to, to men and women, um, in fact, um, to make our workplaces uh, more democratic, to build on work that has gone on before, um, you know, in, in pushing for ratification um, for C-190. You reminded us as well of the various manifestations that violence and harassment can take. Very often we think about physical violence and sexual harassment, but you, you reminded us of the psychological impacts of violence, of, you know, economic um, violence and harassment as well. So thank you um, for all of that. Um, uh, the, the last um, but not least in this, in this round is going to be back to Nelly. Um, Nelly, you were um, talking about how you managed to secure ratification in Namibia, coming, uh, Namibia then becoming one of that so far exclusive group of six that we want to build out quite rapidly. Um, but we know that ratification alone isn't enough to address um, ge gender-based violence and harassment um, in our world of work. Um, it now comes down to implementation. So can you share with us some of the challenges to implementation of C-190 um, in Namibia, and in particular, how are domestic workers and your allies across the labor movement in Namibia organizing to make sure that C-190 is indeed um, robustly and effectively implemented? Thank you once again. Um, it's, it's really... Uh... I'm so pleased and happy to hear this question from, from, from our big body. Um, there are so many challenges in terms of, of Convention 189. Uh, they, the Convention is still new to us, uh, all of us. So we, we, there's still a lot to be done in terms of educating the domestic workers themselves to be able to understand the situation of harassment at workplace uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, looking at our uh, Labor Act in Namibia, the enforcement of, 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 of private properties is, 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 is very difficult. Most of the domestic workers, they have been harassed. They are in private household. There is no enforcement. State union cannot enter this private property. For the labor inspector, it's so, also difficult for them to enter without any uh, consultation with this owner of this property. So what happened inside door there, it is very difficult and for domestic workers not to understand the, 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 the situation of harassment at workplace due to the fact that you are there, you want to end a bread on the table, you want to take something to your kids, you want to take care of your siblings at home. So it is very difficult. There is a lot of work that has to be done. Harass, um, harassment leads to toxic and abuse at workplace. Many individuals are not even sure what is considering had harassment at workplace. As most cases are un, un, unnoticed and unreported. 
So we had domestic workers feeling that for me to go and report this case, she will sink and having fear of losing the job. This is the main things that's going into their mindset to say, okay, fine. If I go and report this harassment or what happened to me in this household, what will happen to my kids tomorrow? What will happen to my mother? What will happen to the, my siblings? So all this have to be done. Um, therefore, we, 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 we have a very good collaboration, Three Sisters Union, that been led by women in, 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 in our federation which is Metal and Allied Workers Union, uh, Davu, the Namibian Domestic and Allied Workers, and then the Teachers Union, Nandu. So we collaborated together so that at least we can be able to fight together this fight so that at least we cannot fight only for domestic workers, but to be able to protect and to educate each and every workers around the country. Violence and harassment is common in the workplace and often very rooted in a discrimination manner where domestic workers do not even understand, workers at the, the, the ground level do not even understand, security do not understand because what they are in their mindset is, is what they are uh, thinking is, is just for them to earn that a little minimum wage what they get so that at least they can be able to, 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 to take care of their family. So therefore, I think um, last of last month, we have a very good uh, collaboration. We ask uh, International Labour Organization to support us, the Three Sisters Union, so that this we can be able to unwrap the, the 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 content of the Convention 190, so that at least the the, 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 the workers they can be able to understand. So the the main things for us is now to work on it in collaboration with Minister of Labour, in collaboration with uh, Minister of Gender, so that at least. Whatever we are planning and try to push this implementation to, to, to come into full enforcement, the first thing that we want to do, we want to look at the ground level from the shop steward level, the Minister of Labor, Labor Inspectors, so that at least we can educate all the entire society, including Minister of Labor, Labor Inspectors, the top leaders of the union, the top leaders of the, uh, the employers federations, so that at least we can fight this fight together. Because to break this chain is not a, it's not a matter of, of a challenge that Dow is only going to face alone. Whatever workers are going to face outside there is also going to affect us as a union. So therefore, we to enable and in, implement, to do this implementation is of to look into the policies as well. Uh, and, and, and at least to the content of, of the convention, the harassment at workplace, so that at least we can unpack it very, very proper. And it is going to, to take time, uh, although maybe the time limit for the enforcement is very short. We already started on the ground level. Uh, Minister of Labor, they done a very good survey. We, we done, as, as I'm saving on, on, on occupation, health and safety on Labor Advisory Council as a subcommittee, we are still going to work on it. By tomorrow morning, the whole day, we are going to unpack on this convention so that at least we can be able, when we come back and, and, and provide trainings and do training, train up trainees to, 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 to the shop steward of the, 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 main, the main unions, so at least we can be able to understand what, what, what are we going to educate these people. Because there's no need for us to educate uh, workers on the ground while the leaders, it doesn't even understand the content of the Convention 189. So the collaboration is very good. We are still going to force on it. And I'm happy to hear from all my sisters the presentation, the good presentation, what they share and what they went through. This is not one one man fight. This is for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Nelly. Again, um, you know, some excellent insights um, there that you have um, you, you have provided to us and the challenges around actually implementing um, the convention once we have it. And the reminder, actually, of course, um, Namibia did ratify both C-189 and C-190 um, to, together. And I think your, your contribution just now reflected really the key importance um, of this um, indeed, you, you talked about um, the um, particular situation of um, domestic workers and those who have to um, work in private households and behind closed doors um, in isolation, often um, hidden. 
um, and how the violence and harassment can go unnoticed and unreported to an even greater extent in these particular settings. But how the fear of losing um, one's job and not being able to support one's family really plays into that silence of, um, of women workers um, keeping quiet when they come up against um, violence and harassment. So the importance of decent work um, in um, helping to prevent um, violence and harassment is absolutely crucial. And C1989 plays um, a key role in that, you know, issues around job security, availability of social protection, being able to enjoy um, living minimum wages. And then crucially, as you highlighted, the importance of freedom of association and being able to organize. And of course, being able to act collectively um, in your efforts to secure decency, to to secure respect, to secure um, dignity um, at work. And again, um, you as all previous speakers did mention the importance of um, you know, education, the importance of making um, people aware of their rights, uh, making people aware of, the, of what violence and harassment actually is. So being able to recognize it so that they can take action um, against it and to know that they don't have to um, you know, be in silence. They don't have to tolerate and support um, violence and harassment, um, particularly um, when they come together um, uh, to, to tackle it on, at a collective level. Um, we have time now, I think about 15 minutes for questions um, and answers. So I don't know if um, some have been posted in the chat or if we're also going to do it through raised hands. I rely on our incredible team from the Solidarity Center and from um, other sponsors um, to help us out with that. But um, this is your moment as an audience um, to interact, to share your questions, comments, experiences as well. And please also feel free to, to post in the chat what you are doing also um, in terms of addressing gender-based violence and harassment and pushing for ratification and implementation of um, C-190. Um, so um, over, to you, over to the audience. Um, I, if there are any questions that came through the chat, um, please do highlight for us. Um, and we can put them to the speakers. Um, and again, not only questions, but if you have experiences um, to share with us, please also um, feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Chidi. I'm gonna just uh, take a uh, host privilege for, for one moment to remind folks um, that uh, you can use the raise hand feature or the, or the chat box to ask questions. And we'll ask you to please if you have experiences to share or resources that you want to share, please make uh, feel free to make use of the chat so we can keep this channel open for questions. I see um, Obed Albert from Kotu, Kenya. Um, and I wonder if they wanted to ask a question. So. Yes, my sister, uh, wherever you are, my dear comrades, I have only two comments. One, to be able to fight harassment in in our area in our uh, decent work in terms of where we are we need to combine the efforts of both the employer and the employee we have realized in kenya most of the harassers those who harass our workers are the employers irrespective also it happens vice versa so we need to cooperate between ourselves that is the employee and the employer and more emphatically to bring in skills and education, creation of awareness of how and what we should do to stop this menace of uh, harassment at the area of work. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Brother Albert, for sharing um, that to us. Absolutely, there does need to be cooperation between workers and employers um, on this. Um, and you know, employers need to be very clear as well about what their responsibilities um, are um, in terms of creating working environments that are free from violence um, and harassment. Um, not seeing any other raised hands at the moment. I know that there are some comments um, in the chat, which 
I would share, and there's a comment from Cassandra who's saying she wonders whether panelists would like to reflect on employer accountability, particularly around precarity. So if any members of the panel want to come in on that, um, please do so. I see hands going up now. So maybe go first to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Reynoso, and then um, followed um, swiftly by uh, Flori Dalma. So Elizabeth, you have the floor. Um, Elizabeth, could you unmute your mic and then um, take the floor? Hola, perdón, eh, es que me compartí Hi. mi link con otros compañeros de la... My apologies, I was sharing, I am sharing my link with other uh, colleagues from the Americas, so I don't know who used my account right now, sorry. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay. Um, I will ask, um, we'll go to Flori, Flori Dalma then and see if um, Flori Dalma wishes to come in. Muchas gracias, muy buenos días. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody, and good evening to those who uh, are in different places of the planet where it's nightfall. Hello from Guatemala. I have a question. I wanted to know if anyone here from the uh, Sent from the union organizations have had a similar experience to what we're seeing in Guatemala. We have not been able to fight for the ratification of C-190 because we have no support whatsoever. There is no support to the union movement. There is five major union movements, but we have no, no support. In fact, when we, uh, when we were in Geneva, our government actually opposed C-190, well, the government voted for it, but the uh, employers are all against them. And we know there's a lot of violence, a lot of harassment going on in the workplace, both against uh, and the uh, female workers in the field, in the garment industry, which of there was, there's a lot in Guatemala, and also there's a lot of violence against domestic workers. So we wonder what other strategies did you use in your countries to fight for the ratification of C-190? Because for us, this is still pending in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and it has not seen any movement. It has not been transferred to the Ministry of Labor in my country. If any of you has any useful experience to give us, please tell us because we are we are at an impasse. We have no support whatsoever. We don't know how to fight for it. We don't know how to give it some traction. Thank you, Chidi, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, um, Flori Dalma. Um, we would take uh, two or three questions and before going back to the panelists, but I don't see any other hands raised at the moment. I know that in, in, yeah, in, in Guatemala, especially the employers um, of Guatemala le are leading the sort of um, the charge to prevent ratification, in fact, of, um, of C-190. Um, so I don't know if um, one of our panelists um, would like to come in and share. Different situation in Namibia, the government was very, very active in pushing for the adoption of C-190. Um, but here we have a situation where we have a very resistant um, government and a very active employers. Um, organization trying to prevent um, ratification. Um, so throwing that out there to our speakers, please raise your hand if you wish to, um, you know, provide some insights to the to the question raised by um, Floridama, or if there's anybody else in the audience indeed who wishes to jump in on that. I think that was an important, um, important question. And Louise asks something similar. How can we convince the government to ratify C-190 um, if governments are aware that they're not able to implement the convention effectively? Namaste. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Is um, that um, Maria? Hello. Uh, I'm from Nepal and I'm affiliated with IDWF, IDWF Exco member also. And in contents of Nepal, the government also very positive and the employer side also very positive to ratify the Convention 190. But somehow this time the situation of the 
COVID impact is very bad and still lockdown is running and also uh, the political situation and transitional period is also very uh, affected to the government to uh, do the procedures and uh, still the trade union and the G1 also lobbying and advocacy um, to ratify the one convention 190 uh, because uh, the due to the political situation the labor ministry and then other ministry is also changing time to time you know that's why it, it uh, became very delay and then also the government also finalizing the uh, challenging and gap uh, gap uh, before ratify the 190 thank you very much thank you thank you so much um, for sharing um, the experience um, that you're having um, in nepal um, of that i think that's it's really um, valuable um, I see that Maria Elena has her hand up and then there are a couple of questions also in the chat that I'll come back to, but Maria Elena, did you want to take the floor? Mm, no. Hola, buenos días a todas. Buenas noches. Hello, good morning, good evening. Hello. I just you wanted have to make a comment. Mm -hmm. Piggybacking on what our colleague said, Julio Vidalma said, I'm completely, she muted her mic. In the region, there's like some kind of consensus that they have to say no to the ratification of C-190. In fact, there have been some proposals region level asking the governments of the region not to ratify C-190. Mm -hmm. To respond to this, one of the strategies that we're doing uh, from the union movement is to actually uh, form coalitions and create even more, um, more of a united front so we can deploy unite, unified strategies against the employers. And the idea here is that first, the unions in the region needs to need to know what the C-190 is and to know it very well and then seek what are the main unifying points between countries in latin america this is a this is a this is a stern fight because some countries have a very sensitive uh, context it's very it's a very delicate situation but these are one of the strategies that we're employing and in honduras besides what uh, our colleague isela said honduras there's a proposal from the union, uh, from the union movement, before a political uh, platform that um, that has the government government representation and employer representation, and it's that platform is pressuring is pressuring the government for the ratification of C one hundred and ninety. It seems that there will be an agreement between the union movement and the government to ask for the ratification of C one hundred and ninety. So those are good news that it seems. Uh, these are good news that it seems will take place in the in the month of July. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria um, Elena. That, that excellent um, information there, and I hope that that will give um, encouragement to our sisters and brothers in in Guatemala um, about how to you know push back against this um, concerted effort um, by employers and. Uh, a government that's supportive of the employer's position as well um, to resist um, ratification of C-190. And I think uh, many of the things that we heard before from speakers can help in this, the evidence gathering and exposure of, of you know, the violence and harassment that exists in our world of work, the coalition building, the making use of the media, um, the um, perhaps, you know, almost shaming um, the position that's being taken um, in Guatemala where we know um, incidences of violence and harassment um, are so prevalent um, can help. And then building the international solidarity. And you know, this, um, this session is an, is an aspect of that um, so that we can all um, lend you our collective strength in the struggle um, that you have in, um, in Guatemala. Um, I, I think Robin in the chat, you, you also um, 
mentioned very importantly the global petition. Turiya, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the petition that um, you started um, in the MENA region, in MENA countries, um, to demand that gov governments ratify C190 and that's now taken on, um, it, it's still open, I believe, and has now taken on global proportions. Um, and this perhaps is also something that can help our sisters and brothers in Honduras, Guatemala, and other places. So Turiya, please do um, just unmute yourself and take the mic if you want to come back in. We have like one more minute, so it's going to have to be very, very quick and very brief, I'm afraid, but um, one minute to you. Thank no. you. Thank you, Shadia, and thank you, uh, Robin, because both of you are two of the pillars of this uh, petition. We organize uh, a seminar uh, for women and the dignity of women. And this seminar invited the women unionists and also women activists from the MENA region. They shared experiences and we had also some of our comrades who learned a lot from this seminar. So we decided to take on this step and prepare a, semin a petition to urge all uh, governments around the world, world to ratify this convention from the things that we notice uh, uh, is that uh, you support uh, Arab uh, unions and also some uh, um, personalities in the Arab world, in the North Africa and the uh, world uh, as a whole to um, join this uh, petition because uh, this could be also a tool that will help us uh, to make uh, the uh, uh, Arab women voices heard. You know that this region is very tough. And uh, when uh, conventions are ratified, there are some uh, reservations that are made. So this is why we wanted to make uh, women's, uh, the Arab women's uh, voices heard. So thank we you. worked uh, with the Solidarity Assistant, and we would like to uh, thank you, uh, Shidi, for mainstreaming uh, this petition. As, uh, to, and just one um, point, uh, if you allow me. Uh, we, in our coalition, we have uh, a representative uh, from the Employers uh, Federation, and we have also the uh, representative uh, from uh, the uh, Moroccan Federation of Labor uh, Inspectors. We don't want uh, the employers to be an enemy. We wanted them to share the project with us and uh, to fight for it. So this is Thank why you. I'm inviting all Thank cameras you. to join this petition. This is uh, a petition in the name of uh, women unionists and in the name of all those who want to end uh, violence and harassment in the workplace. Thank you, Shidi. Thank you so much, um, Turiya. And indeed, I see the links to the petitions um, have been put in the chat. So please do um, click on the links. Please do sign, to the, sign up to the petition. And this can certainly be part of that solidarity that we talked about um, earlier, where um, you know our, our comrades are having um, difficulties um, getting their governments to pay attention to that. So let me just draw to a close by thanking the Solidarity Center, by thanking all of the sponsors um, of this event. A special thanks, of course, to our speakers who shared so generously their knowledge and experiences. Um, we will all learn from that and certainly uh, make use of it um, in our campaigning efforts to rid our, our world of work from violence and harassment. And then, you know, maybe perhaps a final thanks, of course, to our interpreters who have allowed us to communicate in so many different languages um, today and has, have allowed us just a little bit extra time to draw um, the meeting to the end. I saw that there were quite a few hands that went up at the end. So perhaps those who had questions or comments can still share them um, with our, our colleagues um, at the Solidarity Center, post them in the chat, and we'll do our best um, to come back to you. Um, to answer those questions. So again, a huge thanks to um, everybody. Um, you know, Cassandra, Robin, Noah, I see, I see that in there. I know everybody else behind the scenes as well. Um, and again, to our speakers and to our interpreters. Um, over to Cass for any final words. Thank you, Chidi, so much for, for moderating this panel and for all your incredible work over the years uh, fighting for worker rights. We are going to miss you. Um, huge loss for the ITC, huge gain for the ILO. Um, 
Thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, apologies, we didn't get to anyone. Please feel free to put my email in the chat. Um, so please feel free to email me if you have additional questions and I can get them to the panelists. Thank you again, everyone so much uh, for being here. So much gratitude to our co-sponsors, our panelists, our interpreters, everyone for organizing this. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, you know, la lucha sigue. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye, bye. brothers, sisters, and siblings beyond the binary. Thank you so much Goodbye. for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Adios. Adios. Goodbye. Goodbye.